Hi, you're watching A Question of Faith. My name is Brendan Malone, and in this episode, I've been asked to answer the question, why are Christians so obsessed with moral rules? I want to do that in three parts. First of all, let's take a step back and think about the logic of what is being proposed here. As Christians, we believe that God is real, and we believe that he has asked us to do certain things in order to be his followers. So it really doesn't make much sense to say, that we're not going to care about the rules, about the things that he asks of us, if we truly are followers of his. If we are his followers, then we're going to care about what he asks of us. We're going to care about those moral rules, and we're going to strive to actually live them out in our own life. So it would actually make less sense if Christians didn't care about what God asks of us, especially if we're claiming to be his followers. Secondly, we need to think about the issue of authentic human freedom. Because when we think about rules, one of the big mistakes that is made in our modern culture is to confuse freedom for choice. And to think that if I can choose to do whatever I want, and I'm not bound by any particular rules or any norms or any precepts, then somehow I am more free that way. When I choose to do what I want and I'm free to do whatever I want, then I'm freer than someone who is following rules or who has submitted themselves to norms and has surrendered themselves over to that and is following edicts that they didn't come up with themselves. But that's not correct. I would suggest to you that human freedom is actually found when we surrender ourselves and we follow what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. Let me give you an example of a piano. Imagine your life is kind of like a piano. Now, there's two ways that you can play a piano. One is to say, well, I'm not going to submit myself to any rules here. I'm not interested in your rules and laws and precepts about chord structure, about melody, rhythm, tempo, music theory. I'm not interested in any of that kind of stuff. I just jump on the piano and I do what feels good. I put my fingers anywhere I want. I even use my feet if I want to. Now, I do that, but what's the end result of that? All I do is I make a cacophony of noise. Now, my kids do this at home with our piano. They jump on the piano, they're bashing away on it, and they often say things like, Hey, Dad, it's the Wiggles theme song. And you have to reply by saying, Well, no, it's not, kids, unless the Wiggles are now doing death metal. That doesn't sound anything like the Wiggles. And then pretty quickly, after they've bashed away and made a bit of noise, they shut the piano lid and they leave. They might enjoy doing it for a brief period, but there's nothing particularly lasting or satisfying about this. And that's really what happens when we approach the piano with this idea that I don't care about the rules, the rules don't matter, I'll just do whatever feels good. But there is another way to play a piano. The other way to play a piano is to say, you know what, I'm actually going to learn more about these rules. I am going to submit myself to those rules. I'm going to do what they ask of me. So if you tell me that this is where I'm supposed to put my fingers to play a D chord, then I'm going to follow that precept. And if you tell me that this is how music theory works and, and this is how melody and rhythm and everything else is supposed to work, then I'll follow those norms. And if I keep doing that and I say things like, you know what, I'm going to delay my gratification, I'm going to say a small no now to partying on Friday nights so I can spend time at home practicing and learning my music theory and practicing my scales and practicing uh, putting my fingers in the right place and changing chords and all of those kind of things, then guess what happens? After a while, I begin to experience a greater level of freedom when I'm at the piano. It's no longer just a cacophony of sound. I now have the freedom to play Beethoven or Bach or Mozart or R&B or jazz. And if I keep doing that, I can even begin to write my own music. I might even be able to write my own symphony one day. How did I get there, though? How did I find that greater flourishing and freedom? I found it by first accepting that those rules were good and then submitting myself to those rules. And by doing that, I found a greater level of flourishing and freedom. Well, guess what? Our human existence is exactly like that. And as Christians, we believe that these moral rules that God gives us, these things that he asks of us, are actually there for our own good, for our own flourishing. They are not restrictive in the way that a cage is restrictive. They are something that exists like a fence does. They provide a protective boundary around us to protect us from going off the edge of a cliff. What they do is they enable us to walk a path where we find a greater level of human freedom 
and human flourishing. Let me give you one very practical example of this. The Christian moral teaching around sex, which is very, very clear. You don't sleep with anyone that you are not married to. So no sex before marriage, and then after you are married, you are faithful exclusively to your spouse and to nobody else. It's a very simple and straightforward moral rule, and initially in our modern culture, that can seem a little bit restrictive. But in reality, it has some very serious practical ramifications. It helps us to avoid, for example, the dangers of disease. It helps us to avoid the dangers of heartache and sadness. It helps us to avoid brokenness, relationship dysfunction. And when we enter into a relationship with someone and you have two people in a marriage who give of themselves totally through that moral norm, guess what? They really begin to find themselves and flourish in a unique and full kind of way. I think about my own marriage to my wife and the day before I got married, I had more choices than what I did the day after. In theory, I could have chosen to end the relationship with my wife and I could have entered into a relationship with any other woman that I wanted to. The day after I got married, I couldn't do that anymore because I had now made a vow that I had pledged myself exclusively to her and to her only and for the rest of my life. Now, I have greater freedom though, now today, living out that rule where I have committed myself totally to her and no one else than what I did the day before I got married when I could have been in a relationship with anyone. I have found a greater level of flourishing through this relationship. The two of us together engaged in this total, exclusive, faithful act of self-giving love that happens not just as we give to each other, but also because we give of ourselves to this moral norm that God asks of us, we've found our flourishing. We've become more fully alive. We experience a greater experience of what it is to be human. Which brings me to my third and final point. Moral rules are ultimately about love. It can seem like they are things that are there to restrict us. And one of the mistakes that we can make is to think that we should only be doing things out of fear. We live in a culture that sort of goes the opposite way a lot of the time, where it says that you only really do things if they bring you happiness, if they bring you gratification, they make you feel good or bring you some sort of sense of meaning or completeness in some way. And if they don't, well, why would you bother? That's one extreme that we want to avoid because that's not a loving way to engage with others. The other extreme, though, is to say, well, I only do things because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't do those things. So if I'm a Christian, I only follow the moral rules because I'm afraid that if I don't, God will send me to hell. So it becomes like a fire insurance policy. I do this thing so that I can't go to hell. Look at me. I've got my insurance policy. But neither of those two extremes are loving and they are not what God asks of us. Imagine if I acted this way when it came to my relationship with my wife. So I either only did things because they made me feel good, then probably a lot of things would not happen around our home. Because a lot of things you have to do require self-sacrifice and they take effort and they take work and they're not easy things to do. There's lots of other things in this world that are a lot more enjoyable than giving yourself to those difficult moments of marriage and family life and household and paying bills and chopping wood and doing the washing and all those kind of things. The other extreme, though, would be if I said, well, I'm going to do all those things, but I'm doing them because I'm afraid that if I don't, my wife will leave me. That's also a problem, and it's an extreme that we should not be in either. What we really should be doing is saying, I do these things because I love. I act this way out of love. I love you, therefore I will do what you ask of me. I will do what is good. I will actually act this way. And it's a tangible, concrete way of showing that I'm serious when I say I love you. Because love isn't just some abstract sentimentality. Love is a tangible action. It is the action of self giving. And when I give of myself, it's my way of showing that I truly am serious when I say that I love you. Well, that same point is true with God. What God desires of us is a relationship where we say, I love you, and we actually mean it when we say it. And the way that we mean it is through our actions. When we do what he asks of us, we are actually loving. Now, yes, Doing the things that God asks of us can be extremely difficult at times. We can really struggle to live out these moral laws 
that God asks us to follow. And if that's you, you're watching this video today and you're in that boat, here's a couple of things I'd say to you. Number one is don't panic. You're definitely not alone in this. No one is perfect. If you're listening to me, watching this video, you are not looking at a saint, not by any stretch of the imagination. None of us is perfect. Don't panic about that. Now, we do want to avoid the other extreme of saying, well, just because no one is perfect at this, I'm not even going to try to do this. Again, that would be a failure to love. If I love my wife, even though I'm not perfect in loving her, I still strive to show her that love. Which brings me to my second point. If you are struggling to do what God asks of you, don't ever forget that God is all loving and that he constantly extends his great mercy to us. The moment you feel that sense of sorrow, that real, authentic, deep sense of sorrow for your actions, for your sins, that's the moment when you have turned back again to face God. When we repent, when we say sorry, when we make restitution, God will never turn away from that. The moment we fall to our knees and say, Lord, I am truly sorry for the sins that I have committed, God is already there waiting. Think about the story of the prodigal son. The father doesn't just go to the gate and wait each day for his son, which is a profoundly loving thing to do. When he finally sees the son coming, he races out to meet him. Now, I used to have this completely wrong view of God when it came to doing what he asked of me. I used to think of God as being like this overly judicious referee who had one hand on his whistle, constantly hovering by his mouth, and the other hand, he was clutching tightly a red card, just waiting for me to make a stuff up so he could blow that whistle, hold the card in the air, and send me off. And that's how I thought about God. I thought it was this sort of, I had to do what he asked because otherwise I was afraid that I would get that eternal red card. But that's not who God is. If we look at the scriptures, we see very clearly that God's love for us is so great. He is like the father and the prodigal son. He sends his only son, John tells us in his gospel, chapter 3, verse 16, he loves us so much that he sent his only son to die a brutal, barbaric, and torturous death on a cross because he loved us and he wants to save us. That is a profound level of love. That is not a God who is a judicious referee just waiting for our first slip up so he can send us off to hell. That is an all-loving God who is doing everything in his power to come to us, to reach out to us, to draw us back to him. No, God is not an overly judicious referee who's desperately waiting to send you from the field. God is like that coach who is lovingly willing you on to do what is good, to do what is true, and he is there to actually assist you in that journey and to journey with you as you walk that path. Thanks for watching. If you got something out of this video, then please consider supporting this work by going to patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia. And for as little as $1 a month, you can ensure that future episodes of A Question of Faith keep getting made. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on A Question of Faith. Mm -hmm.